Hi, I'm Guy Litt, and I'm going to present on my dissertation research in the Panama Canal watershed. And I first got involved working in Panama as a Peace Corps volunteer prior to graduate school. So here's, here's a general map. Panama is the country in between North America and South America, and generally runs in an east-west direction. And I'll be mostly talking about the canal region, which is right here. So to go over my presentation today, I'm going to present my research problem and then go over my study sites and the scientific techniques I employ as a hydrologist and then present a little bit on the solution and that has something to do with economics. So just follow these logos along to know where you are in the presentation. So it's 2016, the canal's operations are at risk. Three weeks from today, the canal is going to start limiting the draft of ships moving through the canal and that's entirely related to El Nino and last time this has happened was during the last strong El Nino in the 97-98 season. And so Panama's climate is a rain season and a dry season. Um, right now we're in the dry season. This lasts from January into April, sometimes early May and the canal operations really depend on a water supply and during the dry season that's when the water resources become most strained. And to put things in perspective, on an average year we get about nine feet of water uh, and this past El Nino rain season there was only five and a half feet and on average in Wyoming many non-mountainous areas get about 15 inches. So. On top of this, the canal is undergoing an expansion, and, and this is slated to finish this year in 2016. There's a third lane being added for larger ships uh, that can more than double the size, uh, double the amount of uh, cargo moving through, but it's also going to use more water. And so a common question I get is, why does water supply matter? And don't they have two oceans on each side? That's, and that's, that's true. But, it's not how the canal works. So it's a system of locks, and there's, there's three locks on each side of the canal. And the way locks work is there's a, a central freshwater reservoir, and this is 85 feet above sea level. It fills up each chamber and, and lifts ships up uh, in, in a sequence. So this is entirely freshwater-based uh, water supply. Shipping costs would, or pumping costs would be astronomical for the amount of ships moving through. There's 34 ships each day presently, and each ship uses about 150 acre feet of water, which is like 150, roughly 150 feet of water covering a football field. So who manages the canal? It's the Panama Canal Authority, and this is the canal watershed. And this is a map of land use. And so green is forest, yellow is ag, roughly half the canal's watershed is ag. And I look at a lot of different land covers that we see throughout this watershed. And so why should we care about the canal's water supply? Well, roughly 20% of the US trade with China passes through the locks each year. And on top of that, with this canal expansion, it's going to be roughly $6 billion investment to expand the canal, but billions more dollars are being invested along the eastern seaboard to accommodate larger ships that will be moving through, just in the ports and the increased shipping with trains and all of that. So now we're getting down to my research question, which is how does land management influence water supply in the canal? And to address that question, I look at different land use, and I'll briefly go over each of these. Uh, forest is roughly half the canal is forested if you recall that map of land use earlier. Tree plantations are also uh, a booming industry. A lot of uh, European and North American companies are investing into teak plantations and native species plantations. Pasture uh, is also a very common land use you see in the agricultural regions and much like Wyoming Ranching is culturally important, and many people continue maintaining this culture. And then the reality of many private land holdings in the agricultural regions is it's a mix of land covers. So I also study 
how a mix of land use can influence water and how it's moving through the canal watershed. And now I'll just go over the tools I use as a hydrologist to figure out how different land covers behave with under different scenarios and storms and whatnot. So stream flow and rain, this is the bread and butter of a hydrologist. We measure how much water comes in, how much flows out during a storm. I also use chemical tracers, and they kind of serve as fingerprints to understand where water is coming from. And so here's a, this is the only graph I'm going to show you guys. It's, a, it's called a hydrograph, and the x-axis here is time, y-axis is stream flow. And so during a storm, stream flow increases and decreases after it stops raining. Using tracers, I can figure out how much of that water is rainwater and how much is groundwater. And, and so here, uh, I can identify the amount of rainwater in the stream. This is green, and then, and then the groundwater is blue. And so an interesting fact with hydrology is uh, many forested catchments or, uh, across the world, uh, roughly half of the water that makes it to a stream during a storm is, only, is, is groundwater, and the other half is rainwater. Normally, we'd think that, oh, all that extra water is rainwater. It's actually a lot of groundwater that's displaced by the rainwater. And the third technique I employ is geophysical imaging. And so we rain down fake rain onto the ground, and we use these electrodes that have been developed for a lot of mineral exploration, and they're now being used in hydrology. We look at how water moves through the ground. And so dry, dry ground is this yellow color, and as it wets up, it becomes green and more blue. And so we're looking at different land covers and how that behaves. And to summarize my results, we see that the forest creates a sponge effect. And this is from measuring how much rain comes in, how much stream flow comes out. During the dry season, the forest will release a little bit more water than other land covers. Using tracers, we find that how much uh, water that, that forest releases really depends on the groundwater levels, more so than other catchments. And then using this geophysical imaging, I, I put up the two most striking results that you can see. Uh, up here's the forest, and here's the pasture. You can see in the forest there's a more vertical pathway. So that means that the surface is more connected to the groundwater. Whereas in the pasture, it's not really going down vertically as much. It's staying near the surface and more readily runs off the stream. So to summarize, trees help store more water. But roughly half of the canal's watershed is private land, agricultural, so that's not forested. And how can, what we need to ask now is how can we secure the future of the canal's water supply despite half of the land being less than ideal as non-forested? And so it all comes down to economics. And so I work with a group of economists who are working to value water. And the canal authority, they, they can put a, a price on, on how much water is worth to them. And then working with landowners, they can put a value on their current use of the land. And if there's a difference in that, say water is more valuable than the present landowner's use, then a payment for ecosystem services scheme could be set up. So what that would entail is the Panama Canal Authority could compensate private landowners to implement some conservation practices on their land. And we see the same thing here in the U.S. That's like the Conservation Reserve Program through the USDA. So taking off my scientist hat and getting back to Peace Corps, I worked a lot with local ranchers on silvopastoral systems. And the results aren't out yet on what, what's the best way to implement these programs, but this could be a good solution is working with silvopastoral programs. This is a combination of agroforestry and ranching. And so it allows landowners to maintain their cultural identity as ranchers, while also increasing their, their income and adding 
ecosystem services through forestry on the same parcel of land. And so to summarize, this whole payment for ecosystem services framework could potentially work. Uh, it's going to require community involvement. It's also going to have to make financial sense, but it could lead to economic advantage for many of the private landholder, landholders throughout the region and potentially create more jobs uh, with the added economic benefits of these conservation programs that could potentially be put into place. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, David and Jade Walsh for their fellowship through the Center for Global Studies this spring and the Ni National Science Foundation for funding a lot of my first few years of research in collaboration with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute who facilitate all of my research in the Panama Canal watershed. Thanks. <laughs>